Hello again, students. Professor Krauss, where we are going to be looking at evangelism is listening. And this is one of my favorite subjects to talk about because it has certainly changed my uh, way of pastoring and certainly changed my way of thinking about evangelism and what really works. Let me open us up in prayer. Father, uh, I'm reminded of the story at the very beginning of the book of Exodus where your people were in captivity, helpless to save themselves, and they continue to groan and cry out for you to help them. And it says that you heard and then you acted and you eventually saved them. You were aware the entire time. And God, as, as you know who we are and you listen and you hear and you observe, Lord, there's, there's certainly so much we can learn um, about that in the way we deal with one another. And Lord, many of us love to talk. We can talk and talk and talk for hours and hours and hours to someone. Um, I know I can. And yet, when it comes to evangelism and the conversations we have, listening is a key component to effective evangelism. So, Lord, I pray you would convict us and uh, once again add another tool to our tool belt as we think about how we can glorify you in evangelism. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Evangelism is listening. Let's start here with Scripture, Philippians 2, 4. Everyone should look at out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Uh, in, in our conversations with others, one of the, the simplest and most powerful ways we can look to the interest of others is to be quiet and to give people the floor and let them talk and let them share. Uh, principle number five, the issues people face are open doors to connect the gospel to them. And the way we are going to talk about connecting the gospel to people to to uh, interact with the issues they are facing and those open doors is going to be listening. Uh, a couple years ago, actually a couple, uh, five, six years ago, me and my wife started doing CrossFit at a gym down the, the road. It was the first time we had ever done CrossFit and uh, first time we had ever met these people. There were two guys my age, I didn't know it at the time, but we started working out and getting to know each other and uh, you know they were kind of showing me the ropes and teaching me how to do things and helping out and uh, I saw it as you know two guys that I could hang out with and get to know, but also I saw them after having some just very basic conversations, I saw that they both needed the gospel. So it was a time for me to to realize, you know, how can I become intentional with them? And so every day I'd ask how they're doing. You know, their wives were there. We worked out, got to know them. My wife Mandy got to know them. And one of the things I did really well, at least this time, was I listened. And day after day after day, we'd work out together and ask them questions about their day, what was going on. And I would always come in a day or two later, you know, and ask them, you know, updates. And so I was showing them that I was not only just listening, but I was also understanding. And I remember one day Will came up to me. It was probably, you know, a couple months down the road. And me and Will and Kyle went out to lunch together. And Will opened up and said, you know, when you first came, uh, I thought you were kind of full of crap. He's like, you know, you were so nice, you were overly nice, and you just day after day were asking us how we're doing. I didn't know if you really did care or not, but he said, I could tell after a while when you continued to listen and ask questions that you really did care. And that has always stuck out to me because I know that I don't always do it, but that was a time where to someone who was not a Christian, that me just being willing to listen made a huge impact. Uh, you know, the authors tell a story, page 68 and 69 of the book, of you know, leading a group of students door to door evangelism. They come across this tattooed man and begin to talk with him about Jesus. And he asked, you know, he's cordial and uh, they're asking questions and stuff. And the conversation seems to end, but. Uh, a little girl runs out, and uh, one of the, the, the people in the, the book, the story, 
uh, says, you know, oh, my daughter just had a, a daughter. Uh, and, you know, I love watching her and, you know, and they connected to the gospel, you know, how scary it is to be a parent and began to ask questions and listened to the man's answer. And they said for, you know, almost an hour or so, they were able to have a gospel-centered conversation because rather than just talking, they were willing to ask questions and listen to this man who needed the gospel, needed to hear how Jesus impacts the way we parent. People often talk about their hopes and dreams and brokenness if we ask the right questions and we listen. Um, I've had many conversations, even though me and Will and Kyle don't get a chance to get together nearly as much as we used to. We worked out every day together. We still know each other's hopes and dreams and brokenness because we've listened and I've listened. And when we are able to ask those really good questions and it opens up the opportunity to listen and we just shut our mouths and we sit there and let people talk about their fears and their dreams and everything they've gone through, we can then apply the gospel to their stories because number one, people have now opened up about what they're struggling with and their weaknesses and their fears and brokenness. They've they've admitted it. And then number two, they know we care because we are actually listening to their story. Now, if we go into a conversation with only a prepackaged presentation, we might end up missing a very clear opportunity to speak into the blessing and brokenness of someone's life. Uh, if we introduce ourselves and, you know, even to someone that we, maybe a worker that we know well enough, and we just, every chance we get, we're sharing Bible verses and stuff with them. You know, you can't go wrong sharing Bible verses, but if we've never given them an opportunity to share about themselves and you know, share about what they're going through and what's going on in their lives, then we are going to miss clear opportunities. It's very likely that people um, will not want to talk with us as much and maybe even question whether or not we really care about them. Why? Because we're just talking to them rather than actually listening. So whenever possible, we want to listen and create opportunities to listen. In page 71 and 72, you never need to force people to talk about the things they love. I mean, isn't that true? Uh, right now, we're in the middle of March Madness. And, you know, if, if people are, have a bracket, if they play if they played basketball or they like to watch basketball, they'll tell you very quickly who their favorite team is, who they're rooting for, who they think is going to win. Uh, what people do on the weekends, the things they love. People love to talk about those things. They say it's not a burden for them to tell you about their families, their jobs, and their various life interests. Dreads and worries will tend to find their way into everyday conversation because they're never completely out of mind. I mean, right now, as I'm recording this lecture, we're at the very beginning of an election year. And it doesn't take much prodding to get people to open up about some of their worries about, you know, politics or what the way the world's going, the wars that are going on, the, the the inflation. I mean, there's so many issues. And if we give people opportunity and we value them enough to let them talk, it's just a matter of time before those dreads and worries and fears and ang- the reason they're anxious about stuff will come out in conversation. The question is, are we listening? Are we listening? Are we there to sympathize with them so that we can apply the gospel? All right, so let's get practical. Conversation in the digital world. Many of us have learned how to live around people without actually having to be around people. That's a scary thought when it comes to evangelism because we have learned how to live in harmony, you know, big picture, harmony with other people. But for a lot of people now in the last five to ten years, We've learned how to do that easier and easier without actually being around people. But to be effective in evangelism, we have to be around people. Yes, you can do evangelism in a digital world online. But the most effective evangelism is going to be conversations with people um, where you can look into their eyes, you can be close to them, you can put your arm around them if need be, shake their hands, whatever that might be. Number one, the book suggests listen to the stories of others. We've That's what we've already been talking about. Purposefully listen for what makes them them. Ask them about you know their childhood, how they were raised, you know the things that went good, the things that went bad, you know how you know it's it's where they are now, what they 
expected to be when they were planning and dreaming about their future. You know, that opens up and allows people to kind of share where they used to be and where they are now. Uh, number two, ask questions and, and listen for answers. I'm a huge question person. Love to people ask people questions, whether it be students, uh, waiters and waitresses that I come across. One of the best ways we can listen purposefully is to ask good questions and let others talk. If, if we're not asking questions and we're just trying to get through a conversation as quick as possible, we're going to have very limited opportunities to actually apply the gospel. Uh, you know, page 75 has uh, seven different questions that are specifically faith-driven that can open up those doors. But it's not just those seven questions. You got to know your context, right? From the last lecture, you got to know your people so that you know the sort of questions to kind of get them talking so that you can listen for their answers. Give genuine encouragement. It is it is a difficult world, Christians and non-Christians, and people are regularly discouraged. Uh People almost expect sometimes, I think, to, to get bad news and for people to mistreat them and just to go through life discouraged, which is so sad. But we have an opportunity as believers to be people of encouragement to no matter what people share when we're listening or how they answer their questions, we, we've got to learn to care about what others care about. As Paul said, you know, seeking to be all things to all people so that in some way we can, you know, save some. And, and that goes a long way is where we are, we're asking good questions, we're in conversation with people, we're loving them, and we care about them. You know, if, if, if people share and you just always move on or you share your own stories just over and over and over and you're always cutting them off, then they're just going to stop sharing. But when you learn to care about what people care about, that's going to enrich the conversations and give you a chance to ask even better questions and then to encourage people where they are. Speak to the heart as well as the mind. You know, sometimes we can fall in the trap in evangelism of thinking that it's it's primarily cerebral. We we you know we gotta con- we gotta convince them. We gotta you know get them over these barriers so we can get them to Jesus. But it's not just an argument that we're trying to win. And with a lot of people, it's not just a um, an educational sort of hindrance is keeping them from Jesus. It's not something that they want to debate. Maybe it's a heart issue. And so we've got to speak to the heart in these in these conversations. We got to ask these questions that allow people to open up because when they open up eventually and they get to that point where they they trust you and they're sharing, what are they going to share? They're not just going to share their thoughts. They're going to share their heart, their hopes, their dreams, their desires. And that's where we can really connect with them. Remember that with Almost 99% of people, the real person lives below the surfaces. Um, What we see is what people want us to see. And so it is easy after even a few conversations or knowing somebody for a while that we just assume and lump people into stereotypes. When in reality, it usually is going to take time to get to see the real person. And it's going to take trust. And again, if all we do is bring prepackaged presentations every single time and we're not asking about them, and we're not following up, and we're not you know, showing that we care, and we're not encouraging them, it's going to take, you know, it's even going to take even longer for them to be able to, to, to release or to unveil the real person, which is where we're trying to get to. So yes, we want to be patient, but we, we can't just assume we know someone just because we've had some conversations. Because again, maybe they're not even, you know, they're probably not open up and share about all their weaknesses and their fears and failures right off the bat. That takes trust and that takes a while. And just keep it simple. You know, it's easy to overthink it. But in John 4, you're, you might be familiar with John 4, the woman at the well, the, the Samaritan woman that Jesus encounters. And Jesus lets her tell her story, and, and Jesus asks questions, and Jesus speaks truth and encourages her. He empathizes with her, um, and then she goes and she retells other people what has just happened. Um, that right there is it's evangelism, but it's so simple. Jesus doesn't just have a prepackaged gospel presentation that he uses for all people. That in this case, he speaks right into her reality. 
of her failures and her weakness and what she's going through right now. And he shares good news about who he is and why he's come. And it, it changes her. In the same way, we need to view people through that lens that Jesus views her as an image bearer that, that God loves and God created to know him so that we are able to empathize and we want to to encourage and we want to listen. Um, and, and that is one of the one of the easiest, most effective ways for us to do evangelism well right now is to just be good listeners. It means we've, we've got to be patient. We can't just make it all about us. Ask good questions. Be quiet. Listen and, and ask God just to lead you in conversation so you can apply the hope of the gospel to their situation. I hope this uh, lecture is helpful and I really do pray that it's encouraging because every single one of us can be faithful and effective evangelism and every single one of us can be good listeners if we're willing to care about the interests of others and not just ourselves. If you have any feedback or any questions, please feel free to leave a comment on YouTube or reach out to me by email. God bless.